Hello. Hello. Hey. Where's your heart costume well, I, today? I did not wear a heart oh. costume. I was so looking forward I to it. I apologize, but I did the next best thing and I have my Powerpuff Girls t-shirt. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see yes. it? Yes. Oh wait, what are they again? Bubbles. We're blossom. <laughs> no. no, that's bubbles. Bubbles. Blossom. Want, yeah, blossom and butterfly. Okay. Got that? All right. Okay. Bubbles, blossom, and bubbles. Blossom, and butterfly. We just need to listen, or what we need to match. They're actually thinking about that. No, I think. You know, we'll be extra double credit if you can tell me their personality. <laughs> Some of you apparently are going to have a big advantage on this. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so we started myocardial ischemia, and I can't remember exactly where I got to, but I think I had gotten to like this slide and, and beyond, is correct? Anybody remember like all the way back to Wednesday? When you were all studying for your therapeutics exam or whatever it was? The next slide is the last one. The next slide? Okay. All right, so, um, so anyway, today I'm going to go over angina treatment and then on Monday we're going to go over CHF. And I think on Wednesday, I think I'll have, you know, I've put in my syllabus to have some quizzes. So I think Wednesday I'll have a, a short quiz, but that'll be on uh, mainly on diuretics and the renin angiotensin system. Okay. So you want to look over the diuretics. You, you have to know those two things you're going to need to know diuretics and renin angiotensin system. So it'll be a short quiz and, and everything will be straight from like the study guide type thing. So most likely it'll just be like label stuff, okay? Wednesday. 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 That's plenty of notice, right? Mm -hmm. And it's 10 points, okay? And it'll be easy, but but just it's easy if you're aware that this is going to go on, right? So look at those study guides, and, and that, that'll help you in on what you should know. All right, now that I've given everybody a uh, chest pain, angina treatment, um, again, there, there's... You guys remember angina, right? It's or, or myocardial ischemia. The problem is either the heart is trying to use needs, but essentially it's an oxygen supply thing. Either the demand is too much, or supply is too little, or both. That's where you start getting myocardial ischemia, and the pain, etc., that you feel, of course, is called angina. There's a bunch of different uh, medication types that get used to treat angina including nitrovasodilators, uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, antiplatelet agents, and statins. Um, you know, key thing, just looking through these, you guys know how beta blockers work already, right? So that, at least in terms of basic pharmacology, that should be easy enough. Nitrovasodilators can work through nitric oxide, which, what's the second, I've said this many times now, nitric oxide works through what, second messenger system? Cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP, which, Ultimately, it's going to cause relaxation of vascular smooth, or smooth muscle, vascular smooth muscle, or other smooth muscle, really. Calcium channel blockers, again, big in relaxation of muscle, and then also some actions at, at the level of the myocardium itself. 
Um, and then antiplatelet agents and, and statins, I'm not really going to go into too much in, in this lecture. Antiplatelet agents are like aspirin, right? Uh, statins are going to discuss uh, with Dr. House um, in a week or two. Okay? So we lipidemia um, lecture. Okay, so um, antianginal agents can provide either prophylactic or, or and or symptomatic relief. Of course, the goal of therapy is to improve the balance of oxygen supply versus oxygen demand, and that's done by increasing <coughs> the oxygen supply, essentially by dilating the, the coronary vasculature, so you're, you're making it easier for blood to get to the heart by dilating the vasculature, or uh, decreasing oxygen demand by um, reducing cardiac workload, so things like beta blockers that are going to slow down the heart and, and reduce the contractility, et cetera. Okay, and I just look out and I see Katie and I remember something. Uh, Monday, the exam, sorry. <laughs> I'm sitting up here in a power puff. <laughs> so uh, I, I, Monday at 4, are you guys free Monday at 4? Because that was when no. I re uh, reserved a room for... Half of us have yeah, lab. Some of us? Uh -oh. Half the class has lab, half doesn't. No, well, I was going to try to have it out so people could review their exams on Monday at 4. I guess I'll have to reschedule that. Yeah. I'll have to come up with it. That's till 5? Yeah, 4 50. Can you do it at 5? No? Monday? That's kind of late, though. <laughs> I'll try to reschedule it Tuesday. What time are you done on Tuesday? 3 20. 3 20. Okay, so if we go for 3.30 on Tuesday, yeah. I find a room. Okay, so anybody who wants to look at your exam, personally, you can do that. Sorry. Sorry to, again, break the flow of this lecture, but I wanted to get that out before I forget. Okay, um, again, treatment of cardiac risk factors um, can reduce the progression of atherosclerosis and myocardial ischemia. So a uh, key point here is that you know, somebody is prone to myocardial ischemia, et cetera, you can take preventive measures before they get to that point or try to, uh, you know, for instance, trying to reduce their blood lipids, et cetera. So it's stuff, stuff that's going to keep blood flowing to the heart. Um, daily aspirin therapy, depending on who you ask, uh, will reduce the, the incidence of myocardial ischemia. So essentially with antiplatelet therapy like that, what you're doing is you're stopping coagulation, and among other things, you're stopping stuff essentially building up in the arteries. Okay, um, and, and these do uh, lower mortality in patients who undergo coronary stenting. And so, I mean, aspirin is kind of a blanket one, but there are, for actual stents, um, <coughs> they'll, they'll coat those stents, like a, you know, a little tube you put in a, a blood vessel to keep it open. Those will be coated with antiplatelet agents to help helps, you know, keep coagulation from occurring around them and, and keep those things patent. Okay, uh, drugs at lower lipid levels are going to reduce myocardial ischemia mortality. Uh, people have to have hypercholesterolemia. Uh, again, Dr. Hausknecht is going to cover those agents in a week or so. Um, ACE inhibitors are, get used to reduce mortality in people with coronary disease. So. ACE inhibitors, remember, and this is one thing you, you got, you got to remember about the renin angiotensin system, is that when it's overactive, that's, that's involved in, among other things, causing heart issues, remodeling at the level of the heart, right? And, and that's, of course, going to be associated with things like myocardial ischemia. Um, beta blockers also uh, can reduce mortality by decreasing the incidence of, of sudden cardiac death from myocardial ischemia and, or infarction. Um, and again, one of the big things beta blockers can, are going to do or reduce the, you know, the workload of the heart, how much it's working in the heart. All right, and, and this slide is just kind of, it's a really a transition slide, but it does show stents. I thought it was kind of interesting. So somebody's got an included vessel that's going to the heart, so their heart's not getting enough blood. You know, one of the things that can happen is that you can, these stents can be inserted in. They get blown up, but and key thing pharmacologically anyways, is, and it kind of shows the progression here. You, you thread the, the stent in to the vessel, um, thread it, it gets threaded in, you know, using peripheral uh, vessels and gets into wherever you need to go. 
then that thing gets expanded, right? And then so what it's doing is it's holding open the walls of the vessel to keep it open. But um, in terms of pharmacology, you know, these things will get coated in antiplatelet agents. So because of course if you're sticking something in a blood vessel, one thing that can have happen is you get um, the coagulation can be stimulated to you know, nick the vessel, et cetera. And obviously you don't want that to happen. Okay, drugs for myocardial ischemia. Um, first group of drugs I'm gonna go over is organic nitrates. Again, mainly as a class, you, you do need to know nitroglycerin specifically on its own, but, uh, which is right here, nitroglycerin. But this is just a, an old good many Gilman slide that shows the uh, different structures of organic nitrates. So what these guys are, are they're nitric oxide donors. So um, they stimulate the formation of nitric oxide by nitric oxide synthase. Uh, you guys, have you gone over nitric oxide synthase at, at all previously? Super important enzyme. Um, so nitric oxide synthase is, is, uh, is involved in producing nitric oxide uh, by way of converting arginine to citrulline. Uh, there's a bunch of different uh, nitric oxide synthase forms that are out there, uh, and they're um, used in different physiological processes, and I guess I need to not have this. Right. Um, but, but nitric oxide, among other things, of course, is involved in relaxing vascular smooth muscle. Okay, um, and, and nitric oxide dependent regulation of vascular smooth muscle can be dysfunctional in, in different vascular disease states. Okay, um, nitric oxide actions, this is the, the super basic quote unquote chemistry of it. Again, the main thing you want to know with nitric oxide synthase, which is acting here, right, is you're converting arginine to citrulline, and what you're getting released is nitric oxide. Okay, and this occurs in endothelial cells of, of blood vessels. And uh, what nitric oxide then does is, of course, nitric oxide is a gas. And wherever nitric oxide gets created from, it, it then will diffuse about a millimeter, so I, pretty far, you know, anatomically, if you think about it. It diffuses about a millimeter from its site of origin, uh, and then it will, among other things, stimulate basically GMP second messenger signaling. You know, the big deal with, with blood vessels is nitric oxide synthase is, is found in endothelial cells, right, which are right next to smooth muscle. So, and, and as you'll see, um, different agents can affect nitric oxide production by affecting endothelial cell activity, but then that in turn is going to go and, and alter smooth muscle, whether it's contracted or not. Okay, uh, again, nitric oxide, uh, by way of the second messenger signaling, is going to activate monocyclase, which is going to cause an increase in the production of cyclic G GMP. Going to get the second messenger signaling cascade that goes on. Among other things, you get the stimulation of protein kinase G. Um, you'll also get some phosphodiesterase activity stimulated. Um, the overall net result, and what you really want to be familiar with in terms of nitric oxide signaling, is that uh, you're going to get reduced intracellular calcium levels. Um, overall, you're going to get reduced phosphorylation of myosin light chain, which, if you remember, probably been through how muscles contract at some point, but but um, phosphorylation of this, this myosin light chain is, is what's involved in causing muscle to contract, smooth muscle contraction, so you get a reduction in that, and you get smooth muscle relaxation. Okay, uh, th this slide shows the basics of myosin light chain uh, dephosphoryl dephosphorylation uh, with nitric oxide, um, and where are we here? Um, So, um, well, essentially, and, it, uh, and I actually don't have it on this slide the way I really thought I did, but the basic thing here is and what nitric oxide is going to reduce, and of course, it's, you're going to see a reduction in intracellular calcium release with nitric oxide, and overall, you're going to see um, a, a, a reduction in my, uh, myosin light chain phosphoryl phosphorylation, so this is when my, myosin light chain, it, um, along with actin, is phosphorylated, you get contraction. When it's dephosphorylated, you get relaxation. And so nit and nitric oxide is going to stimulate that dephosphorylation of 
um, myosin light shape. Okay, this is, so uh, shows how these guys work. Um, that nitric oxide donors work in a simple form. So, so one of the, one of the so, um, organic nitrates is sodium nitri nitroprusside. So that nitric oxide donor. So what happens is that is going to when it's around, it's going to um, cause the production of nitric oxide. That nitric oxide is then going to go and stimulate the production of cyclic GMP activity, and then skipping all the second messenger system. And what really take home stuff you have to absolutely have to know is you're going to get relaxation of vascular smooth muscle by nitric oxide. Um, so overall, the, the way these guys work at a little bit bigger level, looking at now is. They relieve angina pain by um, dilating the coronary arteries. So you're, you're, you're dilating those blood vessels that are taking blood to the heart. And by doing that, among other things, you're increasing the amount of oxygen that gets delivered to the heart. Um, they can also reduce myocardial um, oxygen demand by um, actually by decreasing venous return to the heart. Um, and also by decreasing uh, uh, ventricular and diastolic volume. So, so you're... you're you're, you're de decreasing the volume of the, how full the ventricle gets by doing this. Okay, um, and then um, both cardiac preload and afterload get decreased because of, of the di this dilation that's going on with blood vessels. And that's kind of sort of shown here. So preload is, is the pressure in the heart as it, before it contracts, right? So here we have the, these arrows are basically, basically filling the ventricles of the heart. So that's preload and afterload is you know, when the heart muscle contracts and then you measure the pressure within the heart. Both of these are lowered with um, these nitric oxide donors, okay, organic nitrates. Um, in terms of uh, other cardiac effects, um, systemic arterial pressure may be slightly decreased, but it's not a huge effect. Um, heart rate doesn't move much, at that, so it um, doesn't really get raised or lowered. Um, pulmonary vascular res uh, resistance and cardiac output, uh, as you would think, it get actually slightly decreased, which is changing that, the loading of the heart a little bit with this. Um, arterial dilation, also people get this quote-unquote side effect or other effect, so some people <coughs> take these things, so it results in reddening. Um, and then also you get some meningeal ar arterial vessels that, that, that dilate, so people taking these nitric oxide donors, organic nitrates, can get headaches, okay? You're, you're causing blood vessels to dilate, essentially. Um, okay, if somebody takes too much of this stuff, if they're overusing their nitroglycerin or what have you, um, they can get all kinds of problems, including venous cooling. So, essentially, the, the, your, your veins, um, they're over dilated, and then the blood just pools there instead of continuing to circulate like you'd like. Um, you get decreased arterial resistance that, that can, can lead to lower systolic and diastolic blood pressure and, and cardiac output. So essentially hypotension and hypotension-like sy symptoms. So you get pallor, weakness, dizziness. Um, and among other things, how, how the body pulls itself out of that is by having a, a, a sympathetic reflex activation, try and stimulate things too much. Uh, and the sympathetic reflex um, can actually restore systemic vascular resistance. So essentially, if somebody takes too much of this thing, so what's one thing that's going to happen is you're going to have a stress response, right? And this systemic or uh, sympathetic nervous system flow is going to increase. And that's going to counteract the, the, this uh, vasodilation that's going to occur. Okay, and um, in people who don't have a very reactive sympathetic nervous system. Uh, they can actually, they can be in danger of taking too much of these agents. Okay, um, the organic nitrates that get used out there include, um, and there's some dosing information which I'm not going to go over because that's not my thing. Um, nit uh, nitroglycerin, of course, gets used a lot. Isosorbide dinitrate and isosorbide 5 mononitrate, these guys all get used. They all have a little bit of different action, a little bit different time to keep concentration, et cetera. Okay, um, in terms of the organic nitrates, you guys want to be aware of toler uh, tolerance that can occur. Okay, so when somebody's taking these, like nitroglycerin for 
myocardial ischemia. Uh, they they want to take the agent at, at the time uh, of an attack or just prior to exercise or stress, or how you predict stress or whatever. But so if you know, somebody can't take these before they do some exercise. Uh, however, if, if somebody takes too much of this or just frequent dosing, uh, they can develop tolerance, which is not a good thing. And, and then this tolerance can result from um, either a reduced uh, ability of uh, vascular smooth muscle to convert nitroglycerin to nitric oxide. So the, the uh, machinery to do this isn't working properly. Um, also, what's called true vascular tolerance is you get a loss of reactivity actually to nitric oxide signaling. So for whatever reason, nitric oxide doesn't stimulate cyclic GMP activity like it normally would. Um, and then there's also can occur is you can get this activation of mechanisms that are extraneous to, to the vessel wall, like sympathetic activation, right? The, the, and it's just like pseudo tolerance. But um, all, none of these are, are good because you, you're not going to get that you know, normal response that you would get with these. So if somebody's showing signs of tolerance, you know, they're increasing the amount of nitroglycerin, et cetera, uh, they, they, they're using, one thing you can do is change the dose. Another um, thing you can do is give them ACE inhibitors or ARBs prior to um, initiating the therapy. Um, and, and that's because when people um, are become tolerant to these organic nitrates, um, one thing that happens is their responsiveness, their system's responsiveness to angiotensin II, which you guys remember, among other things, is a very potent vasoconstrictor, uh, that, that um, their responsiveness to that goes up. So essentially, the renin angiotensin system starts working better in these people, which counteracts the positive effects you get from organic nitrates. Okay. So you can try and reduce that by trying to reduce the renin angiotensin system activity using ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Okay. You guys remember what angiotensin 1 receptor couples to? GQ. GQ, yeah. Big vasoconstriction. You know, you know, GQ. Okay, the uh, most effective way to reduce tolerance is you know, to coach people, of course, to, to only use their organic nitrates you know, when they actually need to. Okay, um, adverse effects of these guys are typically due to uh, the cardiovascular effects of the drug. Again, uh, you're causing this vasodilation, and vasodilation, when it's occurring, in the cerebral area it can cause headaches, right? severe headaches. Um, uh, you know, it, this is common, um, but as, as people use these things more, they'll get the headaches, apparently will go away. Um, and then postural hypertension, of course, can occur with these guys. Um, and as you would expect, somebody's drinking a lot, that sort of thing, which is probably, if they are, it might be one of the reasons why they have myocardial ischemia in the first place. You can increase the effects of these things. Um, and again, if somebody does not have a very responsive uh, sympathetic nervous system, then these guys can be dangerous in them as well. Okay, and then uh, finally, erectile dysfunction um, apparently is associated uh, with the same risk factors as coronary artery disease. So um, if somebody's using a phosphodiesterase inhibitor for that, along with um, organic nitrates, you get too much hypotension and you overdo it. Okay, okay uh, therapeutics use. Uh, this slide just kind of give mainly information slide, not really test it, but uh, organic nitrates get used, of course, for angina. Um, they're, they're, they're also going to show up in the next lecture, which probably won't get to the Friday, but CHF, get the heart failure. Um, also, unstable angina pectoris. Um, Keep myocardial infarction that can be used for that as well, and then um, variant angina. So they can, you know, these guys do get used. And here we go. It says somebody agrees with this, so and we'll move right on. Blank page. Hey, you guys don't, uh, you know, I don't know the Powerpuff Girls very well. But what's that? The Clash is the best, right? Okay. So that's just a transition slide to change to calcium channel blockers. So calcium channel blockers, what, what these guys are going to do is 
they're going to decrease uh, coronary vascular resistance and increase coronary blood flow. So you're, you're, in a way, you're kind of doing the same thing you're doing with organic nitrates. You're increasing blood flow, the, the ease of blood flow to the heart. Um, but you're also decreasing the amount of work the heart does. So they, and they have a bunch of different chemical structures, uh, and, and there's a bunch of these guys out there. That I don't know if they just touched on any of these in terms of their med chem yet. He has. Mm -hmm. So you guys are at least familiar with, with, with what they look like chemically. Um, so how these things work is, at first, uh, at the level of the heart, uh, voltage-gated calcium channels are going to, of course, mediate the influx of the calcium into um, vascular smooth muscle, um, also into cardiac myocytes, uh, and, and, and the SA node and AB node cells. And so when you get this increase in calcium that's going on, you're going to get an increase in contraction of smooth muscle. You're also going to get, uh, you know, the myocardium, which is a really smooth muscle. You get contraction there, though, too, which helps to get increases in calcium into that. Um, and get increases in calcium in, for instance, SA node. You guys remember what SA node cells do? They're, they're the pacemakers of the heart. So they're the ones that have spontaneous action potential, drive, drive your heart rate, okay? And then the AV node cells are the ones that spread the electrical signal. So you're affecting all these things when you're doing some of the calcium channel blocker. And this slide just shows uh, the electrical system of the heart, which we'll get into more when we talk about um, arrhythmias and that sort of thing. But, but basically, you've got the SA node. Uh, those, those cells are going to be affected by calcium channel blockers as our AV nodes. So heart rate and then the spread of the, the, this electrical signal that causes the heart to contract to be altered by the drug. And what they do more specifically are they in, inactivate voltage-gated calcium channels. Um, and they all bind to a, a specific subunit, an alpha-1 subunit on L-type uh, voltage-gated calcium channels. And, and these channels are found again in vascular smooth muscle and also in heart muscle. Okay, and so you're blocking these these voltage-gated calcium channels. You're going to get this a reduction in um, contraction of vascular and vascular smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. So these things have you know, lots of different effects that are, are overall going to alter the way the heart is working. Okay. Uh, and this slide, just again, these, these, I'm not going to ask that you, you know, memorize voltage-gated calcium channels. You need to know that they exist and that, you know, they, there's voltage, um, when you get a, you're starting an action potential, these guys are going to open up and they're going to let calcium in, right? Calcium is going to come in and, and do the things that calcium is going to do. And they all, and all these agents block this alpha-1. Subunit. Okay, but you don't need to know the alpha two, delta, beta subunits. You need to know these 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 channels exist, and they're voltage gated. Okay, um, in terms of the cardiovascular effects, again, these uh, calcium channel blockers are going to relax arterial smooth muscle. Um, they actually don't have a bunch of effects on venous beds, so they're not going to affect, among other things, cardiac preload. Um, their actions on cardiac cells, the myocardium cells, are, are complicated. Um, so, because um, the heart muscle acts a little bit differently than the other muscle does. Um, but more specifically, though, in cardiac myocytes, calcium channel blockers are going to reduce cardiac muscle contractility, okay, just reducing the amount of calcium that's there to help drive contraction. Um, and, and, and then in the SA and AV nodes, uh, you're going to lessen calcium movement, movement, and so you're going to get more hyperpolarization of, of those cells. So you're not going to have as many action potentials. If, like for the SA nodes, they're not going to spontaneously have action potentials as frequently. Uh, so heart rate can go down, and then the spreading of the signal, um, the electrical signal throughout the heart, is going to lessen some too. So you can reduce contractility couple of different ways here. Uh, these things are effective with 30 or 60 minutes after oral dosing. Um, if if some of you, you know, have a major issue, they can, you can use IV dosing of these guys. 
Um, you know, but, but it's fine. It's obviously, shows some uh, pharmacokinetics activity. These guys are combined with plasma proteins. Um, and, and here's one. And of course, I'm going to go over these guys much more in therapeutics, but their half lives can vary a lot. So there's a lot of different agents, different um, calcium channel blockers out there. And you want to, of course, kind of give them to somebody based on that person's specific needs. Um, and if somebody ha is older or has cirrhosis, that sort of thing, that's going to increase their half lives as well. In terms of adverse effects, uh, they're mostly, as one would expect, going to be due to excessive vasodilation. <coughs> so you get hypotensive type effects with these guys, dizziness, hypertension, um, headache can occur with them as well, etc. cetera. Um, they can also cause constipation, uh, peripheral edema, um, cough, pulmonary edema can all occur. So in the big picture, you obviously don't want to overuse these guys. Um, and then uh, the other point I'm going to bring up from this slide really is just that uh, individual agents can be associated with some other adverse effects. Uh, and so you don't want to use like IV for alpha mil or for beta blockers with these guys. Um, you think of like beta blockers can also slow down the heart and help how much the heart works. So combination could be could be disastrous, right? Um, and, and then they, these could be potentially lethal in some folks. But you, you'll discuss more of that, of course, in therapeutics. I'm more concerned that you guys know how they work, you know, how they're, what they're doing to voltage-gated calcium channels, and what they're doing to the heart muscle itself and to the vascular muscle itself, right? That's, that's what I'll test on. Um, so, and, and then, you have know, some therapeutic uses of these guys. But pharmacology, and, and again, I s try and stick straight to pharmacology when I lecture. So uh, well, that's what I'm going to test on. Okay, uh, next up are beta blockers. Okay, is everybody still awake? I know this material is so dry. Buttercup, right? <laughs> Bubbles, buttercup, and blossom. We gotta get our extra credit, right? Because <laughs> I gotta know the answer myself. So. <laughs> okay, uh, beta blockers. So you guys know how beta blockers work. What, what's the beta receptor on the heart? Which one is it? Beta, beta, beta one. Right. And it couples to GS. GS. Yes. Okay, so beta blockers um, are get used for angina treatment. Um, and so that they can actually reduce the frequency and severity of exertion at angina. Um, and, and if somebody's had a heart attack and given a beta blocker, that can actually improve sur their survival chances or they can, they can live. Um, and they are also thought to have some cardio protective effect. You know, essentially, you guys know how these work there because they're making the heart work less hard. Okay, um, so they're um, in using these guys for. Um, angina issues or effectiveness for exertional angina, of course, is going to be due to the this reduced work, reduced, you're reducing how hard the heart's working. So you get a reduction in myocardial uh, consumption, and this will happen both at rest and during exertion. Um, and, and that's caused again by the negative chronotropic effect of beta blockers. Um, as you might suspect, you know, not, not all actions of beta blockers um, are going to be beneficial in, in all patients. Some people, remember when you take beta blocker, among other things, <coughs> something that can happen is you get sympathetic nervous system responsiveness, activation. So in, in some folks, you could actually see increased oxygen consumption. Um, exactly why that is, it's going to vary with the patient, but, you know, largely you're going to think. <coughs> Your body always is trying to keep itself in, in homeostasis, and even it might might have developed a, a maybe not the best homeostasis, right? But, but it'll still try and keep itself that way. So it's, it's, it's beta blockers, and you get this response of increased sympathetic activity that can actually, in, in some people, override what you're trying to do for them. Um, okay, again, therapeutic uses uh, unstable angina and myocardial infarction. Uh, next, just running through these drugs, um, antiplatelet therapy. Um, aspirin reduces the incidence of myocardial infarction and death uh, in patients that have a stable um, 
angina, also another antiplatelet agent is heparin. Um, and, and so with some people, they, if they get another antiplatelet uh, in, in addition to aspirin, that will help reduce uh, mortality. And we're going to spend more time on antiplatelet agents and, and inflammation, that sort of thing, in a few lectures. So in, in a couple of weeks, we're going to cover that stuff. Okay, um, so we'll revisit this. Okay, uh, Drug-eluting stents, I, I showed this slide earlier of, of stents. So um, agents that, that reduce cellular prol proliferation, so things that are going like, to block coagulation, can get used with these um, stents that get put in the vessels to keep them open. Um, so and among these drugs are, is paclitaxel, which um, actually binds to and stabilizes microtubules, uh, and, and so it helps keep the integrity of the vessel wall that way. Um, so if somebody does get a, a stent, of course that stent will have drugs that um, will elute and, and try and keep the path, keep everything clear and keep coagulation from stopping, um, but they'll also be given antiplatelet therapy as well. And again, this is just inside of a coronary stent. Okay, and that's that lecture, pretty short, um, you know, the basics. Anybody know where this is? It might be where the Powerpuff Girls originated. <laughs> Think about it, Hong Kong. The Powerpuff Girls, Japanese or Chinese? It's Japanese, okay. Anyway, that's Hong Kong. That's my wife. Same time in Hong Kong. 